to the April um, local planning committee meeting. Thank you all for your resilience in terms of <coughs> scheduling. We appreciate it. Um, on to order, we have uh, on virtually so far uh, Garrett um, and Dan and Anastasia, who are Anastasia, are who are your guests. And when we just start to plow through the agenda, I think very quickly, on point A, we can review and approve the minutes from 3-7-2023. Thank you, Barbara, for distributing them. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Can I get a motion from the floor to approve them? So moved. Second. Second. Perfect. All in favor of approving the minutes from 3-7-2023? Aye. 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 Is there any dissent? Anybody on the phone? Garrett? <laughs> They look great to me. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so the moment that move, the uh, minutes are approved. Um, Paul, do you mind if we flip flop the order a little bit? Because update on the RFP was first. Do you mind since Amy's got to run to the? That's fine. Okay. You got an hour. Whatever yes. You want. Uh, oh. Oh. Okay. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm no, no. 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 <laughs> Amy, no. Come on. Uh, Dan and Anastasia, thank you for being here. Amy's gonna just go first, if you don't mind. You guys. And then we'll come to you. Madam Chairman, yes. before you move forward, yes. um, if we have um, members participating remotely on our votes, you're supposed to take a roll call, roll call vote, vote, please. Okay. okay. Should we go back and do that for the minutes? I don't mind doing it. Okay. Uh, a roll call vote in favor of the minutes. Barbara, you want to go? All right. Barbara, aye. Jeff, aye. David, aye. Bryce, aye. Brian, aye. Margo, aye. And then Garrett, could you come off mute? Garrett, aye. Thank you. Uh, you. Is there anyone else that's a member of the committee that's on? Yeah. I only see. I don't think so. That's all. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for keeping us on task. Amy. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. If you want to introduce yourself, we're sure. thrilled you're here. Thank you. I'm Amy Sowski. I have been your conservation administrator for almost 12 years now. That seems time flies. Time flies. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me here. And what I provided, um, I handed it out. You should have them. It's nothing in particular order. You would, as you're endeavoring to update the local comprehensive plan, you asked kind of just for thoughts. Um, and so it's nothing official. They're literally, it's literally just bullet points to, and so you can follow along with what I'm going to say. So, um, as I've been here for 12 years, I'm a chief for 17. Um, I feel like I know the town pretty well, and know that know tasks of my position really well. So, just for the committee's sake, and anybody who might be watching, not only is the Conservation Commission in charge of upholding the Wetlands Protection Act and local wetlands bylaw and regulations um, as it pertains to anybody living near a wetland um, and their projects that they do, uh, we also manage about a thousand acres of conservation land. We run the town community gardens. We kind of consult on a variety of other town projects going forward. Um, so yeah, kind of a big gamut projects that are things that we work on. The majority of it being the wetland regulatory work that we do. So, getting into it, just some things to think about as you're, you're gearing up for your LCP. So the town now owns over a thousand acres of conservation land, and that's town-owned conservation land. That's not selectment open space, do you have another one for Ed? Okay. Sorry, but I can email this to you. Well, yeah, we can yeah, distribute we can to the it. committee. We're yeah. going to put it, we have a Google Drive. Yeah, yeah no okay. problem. Again, it's Thank nothing you. official, official. Yep. Just my thoughts on paper. So we have a thousand acres of conservation land, not selectman land, not cemetery commission land, not even, not counting the Harwich Conservation Trust land. A thousand acres just in my little department's and commission's care and custody. Um, doesn't include recreation, et cetera. The Real Estate and Open Space Committee has done an amazing job in the time that I've been here evaluating land acquisitions and kind of putting them or making recommendations about where they should go. Should they go for rec? Should they go for conservation? Should they go for housing, et cetera? Um, they really look at 
parcels that are contiguous with other conservation parcels, or they look at large parcels that might be standalone, but that provide a high quality of habitat um, or other purpose like water protection. Um, continuing, I think key would be to continue to be particular. Sorry. No, oh, keep going. Continuing yeah. to be particular in the parcels that we've hired. Asking to go on mute oh, if speaking. Yeah, could, could everybody who's remote please mute? Thank you. Continuing to be particular in what we acquire for conservation purposes would be key because each parcel we acquire, we have to manage. Um, it's difficult as it is to enforce rules and regulations on our conservation lands. Um, I am a department of two, and uh, right now we are down one. So um, we get a lot of help from other, from natural resources helps, police help if we call them out of necessity. Um, the state environmental protect, uh, police officers do help when we call them. We try not to as much as we can. But it's really difficult. It's like a moving target to enforce these rules and regulations. So I'm not saying, I, I, I definitely think going forward we should be acquiring new conservation land where it makes sense to. I don't want to say that we shouldn't, but we need to, one, better manage what we have and just be very careful about what we acquire in the future. Um, so it's, it's no question I feel like it's a main reason that people choose to live or visit the Cape is because of its natural resources. Can I ask a question on sure. the top or do you want to wait sure, until go she ahead. goes through? For the thousand acres, how many of them are unique, That uh, how many require unique management? Like for example, do you have some that are quarter acre, some that are half acre? So is it 3,000 unique pieces that you've got to manage that are? We have over a hundred parcels. I don't know the exact number. They range in size from anything from probably about an acre all the way up to 280 acres. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, and they're all, some of them, the smaller ones where we don't have trails and things, the, what we do is on an annual basis, we go out and check to see if there's encroachment, um, vandalism, yeah. etc. We don't do much with those. The bigger cohesive parcels like the Bell's Neck Conservation Area, um, the Thompson's Field Conservation Area, the Texera property on um, Queen Anne Road, they all have three of those, three of our main properties actually have land management plans that have been approved, um, put together by a lot of regional and local experts and approved um, by the Conservation Commission. So there's management actions in each of those for three of our big parcels right now. Which which three? Thompson's Field, Island Pond, and uh, Bell's Neck. And we are hoping in the next year or two to do Robin's Pond Conservation Area. Mm -hmm. um, that's another big, big mm -hmm. conservation area where we have a lot of our uh, management issues because it's very remote up mm -hmm. in Northwest Harwich. Mm -hmm. So, um, even back to this, uh, is, if I answered your yeah, that question. was uh, that was helpful. Thank you. Sure. So it, it varies. We try to get away. I would I would advise, and I sit on I, I always sit in on real estate open space meetings, and if a parcel came in front of us for a, for a donation of a half an acre of a lot in the middle of like a subdivision, I wouldn't recommend that for conservation purposes. You know, so it doesn't add to an existing conservation land. It's fairly standalone. Mm -hmm. It's probably another use better suited. Um, health of our water bodies has deteriorated drastically in the last few decades due largely to septic systems, improper landscape practices, just to name a couple of the causes. Um, continuing to strategically install sewer will be key, key in cleaning our waters. However, homeowner education on what practices everyone can take is also of utmost importance. Reduce, reduction or proper application of fertilizers. My biggest, one of my biggest pushes is trying to do a better job educating people about native plants that require no fertilizers, less water. They're very beautiful. We have um, a great list with pictures and conditions that they grow in on our website that we hand out. Um, you don't need to water and fertilize those things. So 
then increasing vegetated buffer zones to our wetlands will help. We have a 50 foot no disturb zone in our town bylaw um, and we have mitigation measures required for development within our, our jurisdictions. Really the only 100 foot is the 100 foot buffer to a wetland, 200 feet from a river, so it's not a lot. Um, we do find that increasing um, vegetated buffers to our wetlands is really helps clean the waters um, before they get uh, more impacted. There currently is a working group of department heads, myself, uh, Dan Pelletier, who's online, um, the health department in Gulf, working on creating educational materials for homeowners to this effect. Um, I think including are looking at ecosystem restoration projects as a way to improve habitat and water quality, such as what the Harwich Conservation Trust is soon to be endeavoring on for the Cold Brook Preserve is an important um, aspect. Sewers are not the only answer. Um, right. um, looking at zoning techniques, such as natural resource protection districts, so instead of your traditional subdivisions with large lot size, maybe allow for smaller lot sizes with denser development, while setting aside land in a subdivision, you get not fingers of land, mm -hmm. not little strips, but a continuous piece of land. Um, for conservation purposes, mm -hmm. provides habitat. Um, something else some other towns do, I think, don't quote me, but I could check in on it, Brewster does, tree cutting limits mm -hmm. on subdivisions. Absolutely. <laughs> um, just yeah. when, you, when you, traditional subdivisions, they can go and clear everything, right? That's crazy. And, but if they, if the only thing they might leave are these little vegetated strips in between lots for screening. Mm -hmm. They don't provide habitat. They don't provide, in my, this is my opinion, conservation opinion, they don't provide a lot of value to the houses in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's very valuable to have a piece of open space that you're adjacent to. Mm -hmm. um, could I stop you and ask you a question there? Yeah. I think one of the things that as we've, we've um, really gelled as a committee and we have been working sort of continuously since September and hearing a lot of information and I think we've uh, started to develop an appetite for thinking <coughs> somewhat alternatively, mm -hmm. right, around this stuff. And so, and because of all the pressures that you're talking about, how, like, you know, something like, recommending, you know, tree cutting limits or whatever. You very articulately put your committee of one. Like, how does that, you know, in terms of, or, or so an, an office of one, excuse me, a department that of one. Be another department. Um, <laughs> no, but like, how, you know, realistically, how does this stuff get enforced or, you know, have you seen stuff, you know, successfully been sort of implemented with minimal? If it was, um, I believe, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but when subdivisions go for planning board approval, um, they would be like, um, they would show not just the house and what they would show a limit of clearing. Oh, got it. Right. No, so we've, we've been impressed in our discussion when with these very real issues. Like we went through in detail eight weeks ago, the <laughs> Cape Cod Commission, like, you know, water, mm -hmm. all, I mean, all south facing beaches in the Cape, none of them meet current standards, they're all, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of, by the way of measuring that nitrogen, we can argue on how you measure the nitrogen mm -hmm. and stuff, but all south facing beaches, not one of them, are, are meeting state water right. qualities, right? So we're impressed by that, we look at that data, but then any of our regulation in the state, you know, that's over, or in the town, that's here, and what the real yeah. environmental problems we're facing are yeah. here. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of thinking about like, what can we do realistically mm -hmm. to sort of recommend stuff that's doable? Sure. Can, if you, can I if follow you, up on that? If, well, can I finish my question? Mm -hmm. If you, yes, but if you had a kind of a magic wand, what are your top three or top four? Mm -hmm. Top three, <laughs> top two. Be, as far as? You know, making an impact on, I mean, you're, and obviously Dan and Anastasia are going to talk about water, but you focused on water and open space for a reason. Yeah. Um, wastewater. Um, and anything, anything that we can do to improve our wastewater situation, okay. be it sewers, be it projects that we're doing, like for Cold Brook, there's a lot of state federal aid right now for environmental restoration projects, and we are going to be going for a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, but... 
we don't protect our water. Yeah. Right. People aren't going to come. Right. And the people are here, you know. Right. You can't go swimming. Right. Um, so in some ponds in the summer months, um, you might get a beach closer. Um, climb, uh, my next one that I was going to mm. bring up is probably at the top of the list. Mm. Um, I noticed in the local comprehensive plan from 2011, there, there's a lot of, of, of really good stuff, um, potentially in the future, including a section on climate change mm -hmm. and adaptations. Because mm -hmm. um, that will also, my other point, one, what I wanted to talk about was stormwater um, and the fact that we're getting these higher frequency of torrential rains, we're getting higher tides. Um, we don't our current infrastructure is probably built to code to our MS4 requirements. Is that enough? Um, mm. Is building to the 20 year stormwater to the 25 year storm event, which is probably happening every couple of years and not every 25 years at this point, is that is that enough? We're seeing roads are not flooded by tides, but they're being flooded by these these crazy two, three inch an hour rainfall mm -hmm. events that we're getting more and more frequently and we're getting erosion because of those, we're getting properties flooded out because of those. Um, so in and general- And stormwater run runoff from it too. Stormwater runoff yeah. from it, which yeah. when it, it can't infiltrate when it's coming down that hard. Mm -hmm. And it's getting into our ponds, it's getting into um, our harbors and river that are already impacted. Yeah. Um, without any sort of treatment because it can't infiltrate first. So, um, yeah, so I, that's, I would, that's helpful. Yeah. A, a climate you. change yeah. um, section, potentially. Mm. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I always worry in comprehensive plans that we stay too much at the general level. And I think it's very important to get specific on some of these. Um, I think the fertilizer is a very tough one. I personally don't think the education is going to work. Oop. And uh, I, don't th I think we would need a change in thinking on with our board of selectmen to make headway there. So I'm going to turn instead to a different example, which is the tree cutting, which I've heard several people on this board mention. Mm -hmm. When I worked um, in another state, Vermont, build limits, um, inside of which you could clear whatever you wanted, and outside of which you couldn't clear very much, mm -hmm. was a common way of thinking. Paul, Massachusetts? Are there examples of things simpler? Do you know? Should we grill whatever consultant we hire? Um, many communities have uh, cluster open space residential development bylaws. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, where I live, uh, it requires half the land in a track, half of the land be set aside as open space. The other half can be used for, for houses. Um, it doesn't always create the quality open space that Amy's talking about. It's often um, around the perimeter mm -hmm. of, of a development, mm -hmm. which is good because it buffers it from the, the surrounding neighborhood, but it, it doesn't always create um, quality habitat. And then there's the scenario where after, you know, you've talked about it at public hearings and the plan gets approved and the developer hires a contractor and goes in and clears the whole site out, which is what happened to me in one, and I made them go back and replant a whole bunch of trees. Which will take a while to... try uh, with the regulations. Oftentimes, the people that are in meetings like this where projects get approved, after that takes place, there's other people that come in that don't right. know anything about yeah, it. And they just... Discuss. They don't read the decision. They don't know what the conditions are. Right. Um, and, and I really, you know, there's a real enforcement Cost, right, staff cost, yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, so, so I understand we do have, I haven't read that section of the Bible, but we do have provisions that allow for clusters. Um, some towns have taken that and kind of turned it up that I down and said, you know, well, you have to do a cluster uh, um, unless we say you can do a conventional subdivision mm -hmm. for some other reason. The, um, the densities involved in Harwich are such that the cluster, and the, cluster the way the cluster provisions are written, they're worthless. Um, they don't amount to diddly squat. So we right. have to look towards making them stronger. We have the ability to do that in the Six Ponds District mm -hmm. because of the densities involved. You know, I don't want to get too far into the weeds. I guess what I'm pointing out is I would like to see us, you know, with Amy, with Paul, and mm -hmm. with the consultant, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really dive, dive yes. into uh, the ways of doing this. Yes, that's what we're saying. Very what, granular. One yes. of the most effective ways is to have enough 
publicly protected swaths of connected open space to make the habitat work. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that means buying more of the land that would have to be managed unless somebody else has a better technique. So I just want to make sure we don't stay too general as we mm. get further mm. on. But then Amy needs the help to manage it. <laughs> Before I um, don't worry about Amy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm even. Um, <laughs> we do worry about Amy. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ecosystem. Yeah. Checking to see what Brewster did. Um, okay. In the in their natural resources protection district. Um, you know, what they, um, I remember when I used to live in Brewster, we had this discussion, I was on the Conservation Commission there, and attended various meetings. They, they use this example, which really makes a lot of sense to me, it's your hand example. Your subdivision can be a series of roads and houses like this with a little bit of green space in between, versus here's where all your houses are and here's where your open space is. Whether that's town-owned open space, whether it's a conservation restriction, maybe even held by the Harwich Conservation Trust, whether it's the least desirable is a homeowner association open space because that always gets infringed upon. But there's a variety of methods um, like it. to go about it. Um, even and you know, in my opinion, this is me. Even if it was a homeowner association open space, it's still better than individual lots. But don't you have to have leadership? Isn't this a top down as far as leadership in the town yeah. wanting to do this? And These are just I, 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 here, I, that's kind of an oxymoron <laughs> right <laughs> now. Yeah. These are just my ideas. No, no, no. We I, appreciate They're excellent. But I, I agree with Barbara. There also needs to be enforcement, too. Yes. Uh, where I live over in East Harwich, a couple of years ago, there was, uh, if, if anybody knows, Hall's Path. Mm -hmm. It was oh, just yeah. clear. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was just cleared one day. Yep. No enforcement. No, I mean, trees are gone. It was like a 60-foot wide path. And to my knowledge, whoever cleared it, I, I don't know if they got their hand slapped or whatever happened. So I, you know, I, I agree with rules, but at some point there needs to be enforcement. Before we give Ed, is anyone on, on the go-to-meeting, uh, Peter or Garrett 1 and 2, or whoever our call? Who's our caller, That's number awesome. one, by the way? Hi, it's Jim Nickman. Oh, hey, Jim. Um, but we, I'm only, we just yeah, wanted I'm to take. We just. Away. I'm only seven minutes away. Oh, well, well, join us when you can. We just wanted to take okay. attendance. Did Pete or Garrett have any questions or comments for Amy? I'm good right now, thank you. Okay, thank you for being here. Amy, uh, just wanted to say really great ideas. Thank you for sharing. Mm. Excellent. Yes. Does Ed have thoughts? Well, yeah, you know the that whole issue with. Uh, <laughs> the cluster subdivisions that we have where there's this little sort of yes. lane around yes. around it. I mean, you know, what I've seen mostly is that people move in and eventually that back fence gets pushed <laughs> pushed yeah. further back yeah. or a gate gets put in and stuff gets cleared so the kids can ride their motorcycles, you know, around. Um, and as to, you know, uh, enforcement, you know, we used to fund a, uh, a tree warden in town. Um, mm. And uh, if any of you remember Link Thatcher, mm -hmm. when he yes. was tree mm -hmm. warden, a, a branch didn't get cut, what he didn't say so. <laughs> he, was, he was pretty strict. And, but uh, uh, 2005, we had some sh shortages, and that was one of the programs that got go. Technically, we do have a, a tree warden. It's the... As I understand it, currently it's the director of the uh, Public Works Department, okay. who has not been, uh, you know, he works, tries to do the best he can with working by neighborhood, but he, you know, his, his druthers is to put things in a shape that it's easily and cheaply maintainable, which means a lot of trees come down. But here again, I mean, if we don't have the bylaw or if we don't have the regulation right. to do all of this, then, I mean, no, we're just, no, we can talk till we're red in the mm -hmm. face. And I don't, I, I personally just, I was, gonna, right, but, but somebody, somebody needs to get management on board with all of the above because if they're allowed to clear cut, they're going to clear cut. It's cheaper. It's faster. And that's what building construction is all about, cheaper, faster. You know, get it done, move on to the next site and stuff. 
Well, development of, of the comprehensive plan is sort of the first step in development. No, I understand that. You know, I said, but but it's still going to be an uphill battle, I think. A question, another question, too, and then, you know, we have gotten a sense in our deliberations so far in this committee um, that there may, there may be a disconnect between, an example is in housing, right? Um, that any kind of a, a huge percentage of a new, of new construction or new housing is immediately sucked up by the second home market, you know, right? And is there something that's applicable in this? Because I kind of get the sense of that there is, there the to be sort of blunt, year t year rounders or yeah. maybe primary residents when you're here, kind of looking and you're like you miss those trees all the time compared to our more seasonal Correct. residents. Do you experience that in the conservation <coughs> division? Or? Yeah, I get calls all the time from <coughs> locals, you know, your yeah, founders. Yeah, yeah. Being not to be what, binary, no, but no, yeah, no, yeah. No, no, yeah. not at all. But, um, you know, we have a very vigilant community, and that's how I find out about a lot of my enforcement issues. But, no, I couldn't do my job without it either. Right, you know, right. So I can't be everywhere. But yeah, we do get a lot of calls like when a new subdivision or even just a new house is um, is uh, the law is clear. Yes. Now some usually I know about them because I either see them in um, permit review. Even if they're not within conservation jurisdiction, we still have to review and make sh check that off that it's not in our jurisdiction. But no, we I'm, I hear a lot about like when new subdivisions go in. A lot of people questioning how did this happen. I think they're from what I have experienced, there is a desire from the public to do a better yeah. job um, designing um, subdivisions in terms of protecting more of the natural resources. That makes sense. Or, go ahead, David. Management and enforcement, you know, as you're saying, yes. very important. How would you compare what you're able to do on town on lands versus what HCT is able to do. Does one have more man manpower? Or, I mean, is it easier for one entity to make it all work than the other? So they don't have because they're a nonprofit. They don't have a lot. More, they don't have as much enforcement ability as we do, um, unless somebody's directly doing something on their land. But um, in terms of you know mistreating things, they have. Um, I would say that they have a lot more manpower. They have um, volunteers who, you know, with, they have a group called Bound Request that goes and verifies um, bounds on properties um, that they that they own. They have a lot of trail stewards. They have physically in the office more staff than we do. Mm -hmm. um, we rely on them a lot. We work together a lot because we co manage and own, or either co own, or one has a restriction, one has the ownership of parcels. Um, they have more ability to get out there and check. We have the greater enforcement power. So they will often, if it's, especially if there's a violation that's also, maybe it's on their property, but it's within the 100 foot buffer to a wetland, they will call me so I can help with in fixing whatever is wrong because we have that enforcement power. Can I ask one more? This is back to both of you. Do we, as the town, have an idea of how many potential developable acres are left in Harwich? Good question. I mean, the reason I'm asking is, you know, 20 plus years ago, you kept hearing, kept reading about build out on the Cape, build out here. I mean, this is it and everything, and I'm waiting for that. And we're not there, and we're having all these additional issues. I mean, do, does somebody have an idea? The Cape Cod Commission um, tracks it. Yeah. And the, the wastewater yeah, plan the wastewater has plan also, has. Um, you know, done uh, projections based on the mm -hmm. remaining unprotected right. open space in town. And I think Dan may want to talk about this when, when he um, gives his um, um, presentation, but they're looking at those numbers again, and I think that's something that we need to collaborate on. Because I'm just wondering, you know, we... If we're talking about 10,000 acres, we're looking mm -hmm. at 500 acres left as far as 
putting all of these potential regulations into place and you know how it, it varies a little bit from town to town but but I think the number that the Cape Cod Commission came up with very recently Cape wide is that there's about 14 percent of the land mass of Cape Cod that's still undeveloped and could be developed yeah oh the moly the most recent I've seen in Harwich is in connection with the wastewater plan mm -hmm. they have a very specific build out study which looks at every property in Harwich. Whether those numbers are really good enough, you know, there's always things that can be tweaked. Yeah. But that information can be made. It'd be nice to have a good rule of thumb. To this a great question. question. Just yeah. to order of magnitude. Question. Hmm. Um, <laughs> just for a freewheeling kind okay. of place. I, I, I got that. Yeah. It's very different than yes. the conservation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Does that does that acreage include the owners unknown and miscellaneous parcels we have so many of here in Harwich? Is that Which I know. Marco, Marco is the resident I, expert. I, I'm just curious um, if our yeah. build out projections include those or not. So I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I don't. Might be interesting. To yeah. find out. I'm pretty sure they do not. There's a lot. It's Paul. <laughs> so, um, Dan can explain this in greater detail when he's doing his presentation, but from what he explained to me in 2016, when the comprehensive wastewater management plan was developed, they did a build-out analysis. Mm -hmm. And so that might be the most recent and most detailed ones. Um, you should also understand that, um, like everywhere else in eastern Massachusetts, all the good land has already been developed. It was easy to develop, and it had been developed years ago. Yeah. And the majority of the remaining land um, has uh, development constraints, coastal wetlands, high groundwater tables, steep Good. slopes, things like that. Yeah, but you say that, but there's still a lot yeah, of development yeah, yeah, yeah. going on. Right, well, I mean, <laughs> that's just in our own. It hasn't in the slowed last down. Three right. years right. right. around our right. Beach, you know, yeah. which is what we're all kind of like shaking I'm, our heads. I'm a with Barbara. Bit. <laughs> when, no, when you look at the, I, and I think that's where we're kind of heading as a committee is like, wow, you look at these very real environmental implications, and how do you sort of, and there, what kind of recommendation, recommendations do you make to try to move the needle on that? And the issue with, um, the owner's unknown property is that there's also a certain class of the owner's unknown that, that also fall into the concept of class of uh, location unknown. Mm -hmm. There are, there yeah. are some parcels or that people have been paying, some people have been paying taxes on that nobody can put on the map. And there are parcels, some very <laughs> large parcels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, you can you can point right on the map to where they are, and they aren't in, they aren't. There is no assessor's records yeah. for them, yeah. and they're not being taxed at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's crazy. It's, yeah. Used it to is. be that that uh, newspaper thing that would came out with everybody's assessment, and you'd go through the street by street to street, right. come to this section, and it would be location unknown. Yeah. What? <laughs> Existential <laughs> question. Yeah. yeah. Amy, is, do you have any questions for us? We're so appreciative of your time, Thank you. your expertise. Thank you. This is helpful. Exactly. Perfect. This is very helpful. Thank you. I'm yes. happy to help. However. Perfect. Yeah, can Thank I, you. Can I no, please, just, just So I think you do a fantastic job. And uh, although you. you've been to my house twice for <laughs> violation reasons, <I> <laughs> <remember> <laughs> now. that was a long time ago. But you found me. So you, you're here, Amy. So, you're here. Follow the signs, Excuse right? Me. That's right. There's a cookie. Excuse me. Your, your staff of one does a hell of a job locating all of us. Uh, but I, I, in, in all seriousness, your, your guidance, your counsel, your, your, how reasonable you were with the project that we did on Route 28 at the old Hanlon's Auto Parts property, we couldn't have done it without you. Yeah. And, and everything that you provided for us. And I, I want to say thank you to you for that. I also want to say, um, with respect to kind of where you were going when you were wrapping up there, this is definitely not the last you're going to hear from us. Right, right. And I think this is exactly what we wanted from yeah. you, is come in and just give us like the, the broad strokes. Yes. And then we as a committee, when you know, we get the consultant, we can start really formulating a better plan. Mm -hmm. And then you'll probably hear from two of us where we'll meet with you more consistently to really develop and drive down on 
what you think should be in this local comprehensive plan. So. And, and please think of us, you know, because yeah. we, we, I think we have... Fondly. We, yes, we have a really robust committee that's really committed to this <laughs> and we're trucking along. And so if, you know, something occurs to you and we anticipate re-engaging with you very specifically as we're developing the plan, right. so... Thank you. Thank, you. thank you for being here. Appreciate yeah. it. I'll thank send you. this to you via email so you can put it in your drive. Awesome. Okay. Amy, thank you. Thanks, Amy. Right. Appreciate it. We're going to hang out until 6. <laughs> um, Paul, would you, I want to be respectful of your time, and I know the Board of Selectmen meeting is going on. Do Would you like to give us the update, or should we go to Dan and Anesthesia? Um, I want to stay for Dan's anyway, so if I'm okay, if perfect. I'm to go to Dan Hello, Dan and Anastasia. Thank you for being here. Hello. Thanks well, you. Welcome to the local planning committee. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're here. All right, I think uh, I'm hopeful we should be able to answer some of those build-up questions. Nice. Uh, but before we do, I'd like to just, I guess, start with kind of an initial um, overview of the flow neutral bylaw that we have and how that I, I anticipate that's going to kind of play in your discussions with the LCP um, and what we're thinking about is how to accommodate you guys in the process. Um, so if you are not familiar, the town does have a land use controls document, otherwise known as a flow neutral bylaw. This was adopted, uh, I believe it was 2018, just before the phase two construction started. And having adopted a flow neutral bylaw is what gave the town eligibility for 0% interest financing on the wastewater uh, projects that we're doing. So the flow neutral bylaw looked at a snapshot in time that was 2016 when the CWMP was adopted and established total flow volumes for each of the five impaired watersheds throughout town. Now the flow neutral bylaw was developed based on existing zoning um, documents and then determined what build out was based on those existing zoning documents. In addition, there was an allowance for East Harwich for 50,000 gallons per day for what was conceived at the time as an East Harwich Village District. So there was a desire to do increased density in the area of 39 and 137. Um, so the additional 50,000 gallons of 55,000 gallons flow there was to accommodate that additional development. Now, since that time, um, the zoning changes to enable that East Harwich Village District have not taken place. So we still do have an additional surplus capacity in East Harwich. Now, how I think that's going to ultimately play into the LCP is I see one of your jobs or tasks is kind of setting the vision for the town of Harwich, where we want to see density, where we want to meet our housing development goals and things of that nature. And really what that ultimately boils down to with respect to wastewater is if we're going to be proposing a zoning change in any one of these watersheds to accommodate one of our housing development goals, that may require a subsequent transition of flow from one watershed to another, which is an action that needs to be done by the board select. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the flow neutral bylaw. I'm happy to take some questions on that and then uh, I can turn it over to Anastasia to go through some of the build out um, and things like that. That was one of the things that we were <coughs> just one last. No, please. Uh, one of the things that we were looking to do because I talked to Paul and he kind of laid out that the LCP process is going to likely take you know a lot longer than the CWMP revision. So one of the thoughts that we had was we would identify the additional build out capacity and different metrics that you guys can then use to divvy up around town be it number of residential buildings, square footage of commercial space, or things like that. So you can kind of use that in your toolbox um, to kind of allocate development where you guys see fit. And then that would be then memorialized uh, through a board of selectmen action. Hmm. Sorry, my daughter's yelling in the back. No, no we understand. <laughs> so we didn't hear it. No, you just gave us a lot of information mm -hmm. uh, very quickly there. So we, we will th thank you for that, because that's a... Um, Zoomed in. Go ahead. Dan, thank you. And I, I haven't I haven't seen you not be able to answer a question in the last two years. So I I commend you as well. Um, Dan, the extra gallons that we pay for in East Harwich, we pay for that? Yes. So we're paying yes. for we're for, for for flow that we are not currently using at present. Presently, yes. Okay, thank you. 
a, a kind of a conceptual question because you gave us a very specific task, but I think one of the things related to what Amy was talking about that we're all kind of trying to wrap our heads around. Um, when you see an acre in Harwich, you know, because of current zoning and things like that, and there are these acres around, say, I'll use an example kind of near me in, in um, West Harwich. There was an acre carved out, and it's, you know, it's not watershed. I mean, it was all developable, but say it's a half a mile, or quarter of a mile from the Herring River. It's clear cut, it's an acre, it's clear cut. A seasonal house goes on, probably like a 3,000 square foot house. <laughs> Sorry. And, and it'll be used, you know, like this is a second home. Help that, what is, what is that? Like, what, what is, how, stressed, how stressed do you get about water when you see something like that? You know, I mean, these are huge housing questions, density questions, but a lot of what catches our eyes, like in a member of the community, is something like that. You're like, er, you know, like how stressed should we get about that, or like, well, what's the scale we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, so you're asking from like a water production ability to meet the demand of housing. Like, like how bad is that for the Herring River? You know, how bad mm. is that for Belmont Beach? How how bad is that for like Pleasant Street Beach? You know, in the sense of I know it's all cu I mean, you know, I know it's all cumulative, but like how, how dire are we here? How is how big is that? That person is gonna fertilize, that person's gonna putting in a pool, that person put in a pool, that person's got a water irrigation system. Like how stressed as a committee should we be about that kind of development? Um well, I guess I kinda look at it from the perspective you know, I guess tough question. So mm. I kinda look at individual private property, I try to look at it as individual private property, mm -hmm. you know, to the extent that they have property rights mm -hmm. that they are entitled to, mm -hmm. you know, and if, I think if we, we as a town want to develop regulations and things like that to, to mitigate some potential effects, I think that that's well within the town's rights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think when we look at things on a watershed level, we're, we're looking at them in the aggregate and you know, when we look at the nitrogen load for Heron River, that's based off of uh, water quality sampling that's been taken out in the field. And then we quantify a, basically an average per parcel nitrogen load. So from a wastewater perspective, we don't look at uh, one parcel is contributing more necessarily than the other. We mm. can't really get that granular. Right, so of course. We are looking at it, um, you know, on a watershed basis, more on an average. No, 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 of course. I guess we're, just, we're trying to focus our efforts here, right? In the sense of, like, to, like you're talking about these regulations, like how, you know, where should we be looking kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, and water, you know, like when I, when I think of a, a, a vacant one-acre parcel at this stage of the game, I'm thinking of how viable is that for a potential pump station site? <laughs> because there's... <laughs> Okay. You know, so that's, yeah. that's at the, you know, the top yeah. of my mind yeah. when I see a, a small vacant parcel somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but from, <laughs> from a development standpoint, and even on the, the water production and use standpoint, you know, and we are looking right now at uh, installing another water production well. Um, you know, we obviously all dealt with the water restrictions last year, so we know that those can certainly come and go uh, from year to year. I think as development continues, um, you know, if DEP doesn't grant us additional production capacity for the water system, we may look at we need to look at how we use the water. I think we have an adequate volume of water to support whatever development is, you know, can be done in Harwich. I think how we use the water that we do have may be um, up for debate whether we continue to allow irrigation mm. or need to limit that for for you know potable water supply. Mm. Can I ask a question? Yeah, Margo and the um, Ned. Dan, <clears throat> I don't really understand how the flow neutral bylaw works. Um, you, you obviously, um, in, in, in putting together the wastewater plan, did a build out analysis and figured out where growth might happen, but it hasn't all happened yet. And so, um, and, and you figured out where you're going to be putting sewer lines and where you're not. Um, but it, as a practical matter, when somebody wants to um, build a new house or somebody wants to add on to their house, add, add bedrooms, um, 
how does how does the flow neutral bylaw come into play? How is it used? Yeah, so um, let's use East Hall, which is an example, just because we have a sewer system there. I think it's uh, the most practical example we have. So with East Hall, which um, what we do during the sewer service application process, that application gets submitted to the health department. And the health department cross-references against the assessor's database to see the bedroom count for the property. And then the bedroom count is what ultimately determines uh, the allowable flow for a particular property. Now, I've given a lot of thought about how to try to manage the flow neutral bylaw because um, you know, I, I don't know how viable it's going to be to do on a parcel by parcel basis because if right now, you know, we allow irrigation deduct meters, but they're not required. So there's there's really no definitive way to tell exactly how much water use is going into the sanitary sewer versus how much may be used outside for irrigation. So, um, sorry, I got a book on chocolate milk. <laughs> we, um, under, we understand. So, <laughs> you know, so um, I've kind of thought about doing it on like a sewer shed basis. So the sewer shed would be all of the properties that contribute to an individual sewer pump station. And I can look at that sewer shed as it was in 2016 for water use, and then I can evaluate that against current water use trends. And then if I see um, the flows going above and beyond that, that 2016 volume, I would look then to do targeted low flow campaigns, maybe we could go and change aerators. Um, if it does look like there's big irrigation use, we could encourage the installation of irrigation deduct meters because the flows that are baked into the flow neutral bylaw developed in 2016 were just based on water use data, um, which you know was inclusive of irrigation. So I think there's some holes in that 2018 plan that still need to get teased out as we kind of go through this process. Um, I think there's a handful of flow neutral bylaws in the state. I don't know that too many people have had them in place long enough to be up against those thresholds. Uh, but one of the things we did throughout evaluating the build out um, with respect to the flow neutral bylaw and the CWMP revisions is we also tried to look at like a planning horizon to see, you know, what is full build out? Is full build out going to happen in 20 years, 40 years, 100 years? Do we need to design the sewer system for a build out that might happen in 100 years? Um, and we did go through that exercise, and that kind of resulted in, well, the 20 year planning horizon based on historical growth trends is pretty close, um, really, to the full build out value. Mm -hmm. So we've mm -hmm. been proposing to keep with the full build out at this phase just because that evaluation had those numbers so close. And when we're talking about the design of a sewer collection system, um, you know, the minimum pipe size can handle a pretty substantial amount of flow, especially for a town like Carwich. Uh, so we're not really going to be seeing significantly larger diameter pipes in the collection system if we look at a full build out year planning process. Okay. I've rambled a little bit there. But no, yeah. we understand. It's, it's very complex. Thank you. But Jim has a question. Yeah, to yeah. me, these things seem somewhat interrelated in the sense of if you build bigger sewers, you could start having smaller parcels. Or if you said we're going to have bigger parcels, you could build less sewers. So it, you know, it's not like these are independent choices. And, and, th and then you get the thing like auxiliary houses or whatever they call them, which is another set of uh, rooms that are being built. Yeah, well, I guess what I would say is that even if you take, um, so for example, in East Harwich, there is a minimum 10,000 feet, feet of lot space per bedroom, right? So that lift is going to be there because the right now it's a watershed protection district. Um, and there's nitrogen sensitive regulations that are proposed, which is going to kind of combine air, or, or establish nat sensitive natural resource areas, which would keep that 10,000 square foot delineation there, right? So even if we take a one acre lot zoning and divide it into half acre lot zoning, those two lots are still only going to be allowed the same flow uh, that they would be under the, the single lot. I think Anastasia has some data to, or you have a presentation for us, thank you, right? <laughs> Can I ask one question first? Sure, sure, go ahead, Pete. Okay. Thanks, sorry about this. Um, and can I ask about the water bands, the irrigation water bands, and how, it, um, how 
well water is regulated. You maybe touched on this a little bit, but those with wells do not have to adhere. And is that a, is there any way to control that if we have to implement a water ban again, or did you already have to cover? Um, yeah, so we did look at that. There was the water ban last year. Um, I would say on on the overall, we had very great response to the water ban. But prior to, we were averaging about 6 million gallons per day. After the ban, we were down to about 4 million gallons a day. Um, but to your point, we as the public water supplier do not have jurisdiction over um, private wells. So they technically, by statute, do not have to adhere, although we would certainly appreciate them adhering to the water restrictions. Um, That's in order to do town statute, sorry to interrupt you, town, not state. And yeah, so in order to regulate private wells, we would have to adopt a local bylaw that would enable the water department, um, water commission, water department to regulate those wells. Um, so that's something that would need to take place at the local level, but there's nothing at the state level that, that allows us to do that at this point. I don't think okay, either. and then real quickly on the net, on the net, no net new outflows, um, how does the offset process work? I know that you, you know I'm, I'm sort of recused on the specific project that you're familiar with in, in my neighborhood, but more broadly, I, I want to ask, how does the town participate in an offset review for a development project that might not be able to adhere to that net, no, no, no net of septic? Um, so is it just the need? Uh, I I we love it. it. We love it. Just, Here comes the question. Just the he can't answer. Or does the town have a role? Um, so do we have a, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to understand the question. So do we have a role in, uh, if, a, if, if a developer proposes to offset their flow with yeah, well, so property, they, they, are we thinking if they wanted more flow than what was allowed in 2016? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So it depends on the extent, right? So if you are a single family homeowner, uh, there's a process within the sewer use regulations and that flow neutral bylaw that would enable you to petition, um, I believe it's the health department and or the water wastewater commission for additional flow. If you're talking about something like a 40B project, um, like we had on Sisson Road, which is going from you know 10 units to potentially 94, mm -hmm. that's going to have a far greater impact on the flow for that watershed. So that would require a larger reallocation of flow by the Board of Select to support that project. Um, one of the concerns I have with something like a 40B project is my understanding is that they have a pretty streamlined process that enables them to circumvent a lot of the local um, regulations, zoning regulations, and things of that nature. So I don't yet know how the 40B process's ability to circumvent local bylaws will play into our local flow neutral bylaw. Um, there's language in the re uh, regulation that allows us to recover costs associated with an increase in flow. Um, a quick example would be, say, what box it wants to tie in, we are at our 350,000 gallon capacity in Chatham. If we were to then purchase additional capacity with Chatham, I would say that purchase capacity fee would be borne by the work faucet. Um, so there's, there's, there is language in there to recover costs relative to, but I don't know how effective we're going to be should that project be a 40B project. So it, so it hasn't been tested is what you're saying, the 40B? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, interesting. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, and I live in East Harwich. Remember, Tar we have Anastasia's talk, too. Oh, right. okay. okay. Well, maybe this. <laughs> and I live in East Harwich, so this could be. Uh, I, I won't take us off into my neighborhood. But, uh, Dan, quick question. Uh, when, you're, when you've completed the East Harwich <coughs> portion of the, the Harwich plan, what percentage of the nitrogen load that you're, you're impacting what, what percentage of the aggregate load are we decreasing right. uh, for, for the overall town of Harwich? I think we're trying to understand the scale. What's that the, was my question about like the rando house, you know, that that will annoy somebody versus like, yeah, like what, 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 what is this 20% of the yeah. town's goal or is this more than that? 
Um, so I would say, so we have a watershed permit in East Harwich, right? So we, we all know East Harwich is Pleasant Bay, mm -hmm. but there's actually a bunch of sub-watersheds within that. Um, and each sub-watershed has its... Sorry. Uh, that's we right. love it. We love it. It's all good. That's all right. <laughs> one second. Let me calm the waters here. <laughs> speaking, oh, speaking of watershed. I have been there so much. Yeah. I understand that completely. <laughs> the waters, so to speak. And, hey, can anybody hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yep. Anastasia, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to, so um, that 55,000 gallons today represents about 5% of the overall flow that the CWM is currently looking 5%? 5%. Hmm. Small. Yeah. All right, I'm back. Mm. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so with what we completed in the there. phase two sewering, we have removed the total amount of nitrogen we needed to remove from <gasps> the upper and lower Muddy Creek sub-watersheds within Pleasant Bay. And for the phase three project that we're proposing to do, we will remove all, just about all the nitrogen we need to in the Round Cove and Pleasant Bay sub-watersheds, and that is including build-out and future development. Um, so it's as far as a percentage of gross total sewered area, I'd have to go back and look. Uh, but I would say we're probably in the 20% range. Um, I want to say we have a sewer about 60% of the town in total. We have about 10,000 parcels. So phase two is just about 500 parcels. I think phase two is between six and 700. So we're probably in that 20, 20% range. Okay, 20% of the aggregate town plan. All right, yeah. thanks. And the other question, and I don't know if Anastasia has this or not, but we were talking earlier about how much uh, open land is there still yet to develop in Harwich? Just on a kind of a, a swag, uh, on a percentage basis, is there, uh, what, what's, what's your feel for how much more development is there to still go yet? Let me, um, let me actually pull up a slide so we can visually look at some of these concepts. Thank you. If I'm able to Please, thank you. Good segue. Um, that's all right. It's great. Go ahead. We can see your slot. Yeah, we can see your screen. Wonderful. Um, and Dan did a really great job of giving an overview of the concepts in this presentation. So we could. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so there's. Can, can anybody? Yeah, we need a we need a bigger. Can you go into screen show mode? I'm sorry. Oh yes. Yeah. A little bit. <clears throat> Much better, thank you. Um, so the, there's different components that we looked at for the flow, and this is for each of the five watersheds in Harbor. Allen Harbor, Woodsmere, Sacramento, Pleasant Bay, and Harry River. What's in dark blue represents the town's current, um, current water usage. So that's basically your current development. And then we have allowances to bring us up to a point of projection, and the green is to build out. So the difference between the blue and the remaining components is your um, capacity oh, to build out. Yeah. So that looks like we're at 80 or 90 percent. Yeah, we're, 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 we're getting the general idea, but we can't see the specific watershed and stuff just because of the size of the slides. Yeah, we but, can't, you can't see the legend. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the, maybe, we, maybe you'll be so kind to share your slides with us at the end, and we can, you know, we'll, we'll put it on our Google Drive kind of thing. They're actually, the, the presentation that they made to the Board of Selectmen is available already. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that Go this? ahead and the stage. Yeah. 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 It's... This is what just came out in yeah. the middle of March. Yeah. But in most, in most of your watersheds, you are fairly, fairly close to build out with the most capacity in the Herring River watershed. Hmm. 
one thing to note too is that um, you know through the acquisition of undeveloped parcels, undeveloped developable parcels, we can create more capacity. Um, you know, so when we're looking at build out right now, we're looking at build out as un undeveloped parcels. And if there's, I know HCTs bought a couple of big, pretty big ones in the Herring River um, recently. So you know, those can all result in more flow, more capacity that can enable different changes throughout your process. So, so is there a reason that you go finish East Harwich before starting up another area? Or, or is, is it more cost effective to finish East Harwich than start the next big area? Uh, maybe that's the best question. Yeah, yeah well, I guess for, for East Harwich, it was, in my opinion, the easiest place to rip the Band-Aid out and, and accomplish something. Okay. Um, because we have an IMA with Chatham, they had an existing plant with capacity to accept wastewater. That was really the easiest way, quickest way for us to start making the change. Um, at this stage, um, there's also provisions within the IMA to accept flow from the Great Sand Lakes area. But beyond that, Harwich has to do one of two things. Either establish another IMA with a neighboring community for treatment of wastewater outside of East Harwich, or we would have to consider building our own treatment plant in town. Um, so really, up and until we have a, an additional point of treatment, we're kind of locked to East Harwich. Okay, thanks. Anastasia, is there more you want to share with us? Oh, Ian, would you like me to give an overview of the, the Board of Select um, Board of Select and Select? Yeah. So this one's put together as um, an overview of our project. So we've been talking a lot today about the, the CWMP. The CWMP is a nutrient and wastewater management tool. And it's it's a document that's meant to support the town's vision for growth. So it's not meant to be a zoning plan, but it is important as the town is looking at growth that that's incorporated into the CWMP so that the nitrogen goals of each of these different watersheds can be managed um, to meet the overall water quality goals for the five watersheds in Harvey. Um, as Dan mentioned, the town does have a CWMP, which was completed in 2016, and the project that we're working on is um, currently a revision of targeted portions of that CWMP that were made through public discussion. Uh, and as Dan again mentioned, one of the things, and please feel free to ask questions if we go along if anything comes up, we don't need to wait until the end of the book. Um, so a couple of key things that we're looking at, as Dan mentioned, uh, there's currently an opportunity to send close to Chatham, but we need to identify either um, wastewater treatment in Harwich or looking at partnering opportunities with neighboring communities. Um, there are projects that have been implemented, including the Money Street Corporate Widening Project, which does have an extra investing aspect, so that's being evaluated in how to that how we manage the rest of the nitrogen in this town with the results of that project. And the town is uh, participating in the Pleasant Bay Alliance watershed permit, where there's a lot of data and a lot of modeling that's being collected for that watershed. And we're looking to see that the plan needs to be adjusted based on the findings of that one, as well as the initial sewer implementation. Um, so there's a number of evaluations that we're doing as part of our project. What we want to talk with you today is the work that we're doing looking at zoning and build out assumptions. Um, and there's also a, we're also looking at freshwater ponds as well as coastal estuaries as part of this project. Um, so this is a breakdown of the flows from the original 2016 CWMP. And those flow projections, which is what your flow neutral bylaws are based around, have three major components. Um, so it's based on the current conditions, which is represented by the water used in each of the watershed. And then the green is at that time the capacity to build that. Um, so the Massachusetts Estuary Project is set the management goals for each of the five watersheds. 
did a build out analysis as part of their study where they looked at what's the maximum subdivision based on garbage disposal zoning to achieve build out. Um, and then as Dan mentioned, there was an additional factor that was added of 55,000 gallons per day, which just gives you an idea of the scale of magnitude compared to the remainder of the flow um, for that increased density that hasn't materialized in the zoning. And then additionally, there were flow allocations for three areas outside the water, 28 in Harwich Court, the Great Sand Lakes area, and the campground area. So as Dan mentioned, um, we wanted to look at what does the 20-year planning horizon look like compared to uh, overall build-out. One of the main components in a planning horizon is to look at is there large population growth in the town? The, the graph on the right shows the population projections that are put together by UMass Dynasty Institute in Harwich, right, which shows the fairly flatline population growth. And we worked with the, the former town planner. We're now starting to work with Paul to see what will grow, what is growth anticipated to look like in Harvey. Um, the town planner did note that there is a 2016 housing reduction plan, which has both global, uh, affordable housing that needs to be met, and that the redevelopment of commercial properties, while there was redevelopment, a lot of those different uses have very similar water uses. So for instance, the restaurant would get sold and would become a restaurant with a similar water usage. Um, and the reason we're looking at water for all of this is water directly correlates to how much water is generated from each parcel. So for the 20-year planning horizon, we looked at how much capacity to build out would be taken to meet the affordable housing goal. And then also included an allowance based on historical water data, looking at how much that water use has increased. And if we kept that same projection over the next 20 years, how much we would anticipate existing properties to increase their wastewater, their water usage and their wastewater generation. Can I ask a question? You you're showing <laughs> yeah, you're showing population declining. I just saw a statistic today that showed two areas of Massachusetts that had population growth. One was out in western Massachusetts, and the other was Cape Cod and the islands. So I just I wonder if dynamics over the last three years modified that, so that's number one. And the other is population is one thing. The other is housing units or physical, um, um, the physical buildings, mm -hmm. houses. Uh, so I'm just wondering what your, you know, what the thoughts are and the assumptions on new houses, new dwellings. So those new houses and new dwellings, um, to the extent allowable by your current zoning, are factored into the build-out analysis. So that, that is represented in that top three box. Uh, so build-out means to the maximum extent of how much can you build by your current zoning? What would that look like? So I would, I would consider that already factored into the analysis. Dan, I can also say, I would just, you know, as far as, you know, COVID and its impact on housing, I think that's still yet to be materialized in a lot of projections. Right. Uh, I think we currently have a restructuring over the last few years, but. Uh, I don't know if we have trends yet relative to that. No, I, and, I, and I, I, I didn't mean to be, uh, I, it was more informative to say that we just need to be aware of, th th this is dynamic. I mean, I think things are changing yeah. rapidly. We've got more um, part-time homeowners now than we had f a few years ago. Uh, so there, I think there are several dynamics that are now impacting what we're trying to face here. Hey, Dan, we're super sensitive to the, the home work thing. You, you're welcome to step away. You, we, yeah. We've gotten, we've, okay, like, or we don't mind at all. And we can finish on with Anastasia. I don't want to, I don't want to browbeat you. We're very grateful for everything you've given us so far. So, so. All right, but Jim's got a question. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to step away, Dan, whenever you need to. Well, no, either of your answers, I guess. But. 
<laughs> it's interesting. Our, our discussion today, and a lot of our discussion as a committee, is around environmental issues and water issues and all that. And and this truly has that ilk to it. Um, but is it also our responsibility to worry about all the jobs that are created by building houses and doing all these things? Sure. And yeah, sure. Sure. And, sure. And, and, and how do we? How do you get yeah. those two they're together? All, yeah, yeah. They're all connected. Well, but I know, we're talking to the water commissioner right all. now. Yeah. <laughs> True. There will be an element or a well, chapter on economic development. So we'll get yeah. to that. In, in yeah. Which is, I'm glad you brought it up because it certainly is important because a lot of the, the, the local native workforce yeah. is engaged in development related yeah. activities. And, and it gets back to education. Maybe we should get be yes. telling kids not to learn carpentry to learn <laughs> <laughs> something else. You know, but I don't know. Um, those are big. Those are difficult issues. So. Puzzle, right? It's a big mm -hmm. puzzle. Big puzzle. Yeah, and people have been making good livings for a sure. long time, and all of a sudden you can turn that off. No, so. right, right. right. But it's also harder to find younger people working into the trades yes. because of the housing situation. Yes, exactly. That's the other side. I mean, I think somebody said the average contractor, general contractor in the state is now something like 54 or 56 years old. Yes, like 20 too. years older than it should be. Look at that. 70. Anastasia, <laughs> <laughs> keep going. We want, we want to be respectful of your guys this time so we can free you, and then we'll deliberate. You know, I think one of the things we try to build into this plan is flexibility for unknown conditions, such as five years ago, none of us would have ever anticipated COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be able to review the data and to incorporate it into the plan at key milestones as it's implemented. So this is a, a very similar graph to what I showed with the same fillback. And what it's doing is adding those different allowances. Um, so the orange, the original NEP data was based on about 2004 to 2007 data. So we worked with Dan to get more recent water data, look at how many houses have been developed since those original reports were done to bring it up to today's water conditions. And then allowing for me to account for the production goal and for um, the general increase in water usage. We took an initial assumption on where those housing development goals would be based on how much developable, the proportion of developable land that is in each one of the watersheds, but that is something that can be moved as part of this process. Um, if there are locations that are more likely for affordable housing, and then we still have our, at this point, we still have our 55,000 gallons per day allocation in Pleasant Bay. And in the next slide, we'll talk about roughly what that represents and how it could potentially be allocated to the different watersheds. Any questions on, on this breakdown here? Um, just, uh, just a comment that I, I, I heard the presentation that, that, that you all made um, a couple weeks ago before the selectmen, and it was a wonderful presentation, and I, I actually, it's, it's online, you can, you can go get it and, and watch it, and it's, it's definitely worth watching. Um, but, but the notion of the reallocation of that 55,000 gallons from East Harwich, um, my, I would footnote that right at this point in time to say, don't assume that we won't need it in East Harwich, because I think this group is talking about um, trying to um, concentrate development in designated mm -hmm. growth centers. The, the zoning plan that was proposed several years ago was not successful. That doesn't mean that we can't go back and revisit that mm -hmm. issue. So um, I, you know, I, just, I just want to footnote that for you. So can I add to that? that Perfectly put. Mm -hmm. I so we have about north of ten thousand housing units in Harwich. Is that about right, Dan? And about forty-eight hundred of them are seasonal, if if I'm remembering the math correct, right? So I would imagine that seasonal housing is less impactful on our wastewater versus having all ten thousand plus units be year-round, right? How do you factor in, and it's probably on a slide coming up here, but how do you factor in commercial growth? And I, I, I guess another question I would ask is, how does commercial 
water usage and, and, and um, waste compared to, to our, our traditional housing? Is it 30% of, of our wastewater is commercial and the rest is housing, or is it? Again, the scale issue. The scale. We're all it's, trying to understand. Yeah, I'm like, just trying to know, understand like how, grand, yeah. how commercial factors into this projection, because projections are just projections. So to answer the, the first question about how much commercial was built into the road, um, based on our discussions with the former town planner, where he wasn't, he didn't indicate that there, he saw substantial commercial growth. What he saw was um, shifting of property. So that is an assumption that we carry, um, which can be modified if there is a design. So if we want to add in and out the commercial growth. Yeah, I was just um, pulling up a report real quick. Give me one second. Um, just in terms of water use, right? So residential versus commercial. Um, we have 9,607 residential water service connections. And we have 382 commercial or business uh, water service connections. The residential water use was, for last year, was about 570 million gallons versus a commercial water use of about 47 and a half million gallons. Um, so the commercial definitely is a very small proportion uh, relative to everything else. See, a question? I, I've, I'm, I tried to stump you and, and get you to not be able to answer a question. You just <laughs> pulled it right up. Thank you. So is there a percentage of commercial growth that we're factoring into this, Ed? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I imagine in the, the East Harwich Village plan was uh, a fair amount of it was uh, commer allocated for commercial expansion. But at higher density housing too. Yeah. Which goes yeah. back to your point, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It all hinges on Title V too. Um, so whatever mm -hmm. would be commercially uh, you know, available to a commercial property under Title V is what is now available to a commercial property under uh, the sewer use, flow neutral bylaws, mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie O'Neill would be a much better person to, to get into the you know, gallons per square foot of commercial space um, relative to, have, to Title V. So you got me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to add, I also think that pu publicly um, our residents at least some of them that I've spoken to, if not a lot, they, they feel that the sewer implementation is a, a permit to just grow. Right, grow yep. absolutely. Right, right, right. And absolutely. Right. There's, so, a, there's a PR but pro it's not, problem there. We're not defined. Yeah. Right, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but I would argue it's not that. I think the first mode of business, and when I spoke to you 18 months ago, Dan, about this, it's, it's not that. It's to clean our nitrogen. Right. That's first and foremost. It's not a you know a blanket permit to go build now because well, we have sewer. And know, I hold on. And I, I I'm sorry. sorry. And I think our committee needs to keep that in mind mm -hmm. while we're discussing the you know the next ten years of Harwich and not and not discount it, but not totally accept it either. And, so, and, but I think I, I understand how the public can be confused. One hundred percent. Because there's two two different things going on. You're you're getting upset about those trees are cut down, and there's that big right. one point five million dollar house going there, and maybe a whole subdivision of them, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. our regulation, to speak colloquially, I, I mean this respectfully, but just descriptively, because our regulations are one place. And then mm -hmm. we have the important work happening with the sewer around nitrogen, and so it's if you, it's easy to conflate the two, even Absolutely. though they're two separate issues. But there are several subdivisions right. going in, right. Sure. Right. not just one. Right. Sure. So, right. Dan, um, you know, as uh, Jeff Jeff pointed out, there's uh, <laughs> what forty eight hundred. Uh, seasonal properties, roughly, um, in, in sort of allocating uh, water use, you, you don't make it a, a distinction of whether it's seasonable or a year-round property. 
because no, and I think, it can become a year-round property. Right. And I think something to understand, too, about the development of the TMDLs and nitrogen removal goals and requirements is they were based on actual water use, right? So although a seasonal property is going to have a lot more water use in the three, four months around summer, we're, we were looking at annual average water use, and that's applied to a standard concentration of nitrogen of 26.25 milligrams per liter. So it's it's a simple you know math problem to determine the amount of nitrogen contributing from any particular parcel, and then that's what went into developing the removal requirements that are within a watershed plan. Great. Other questions or Anastasia is more for you to tell us. We, we never quite answered my question, oh. which I got from Barbara. But how much? Well, how much open space is there on a maybe on a gross percentage basis? Is there left to develop in Harwich? Is there ten percent, twenty percent of the land yet available to develop? I think we have that number. I don't know if Anastasia has that number in front of her. Uh, readily available, but I know that that was definitely I think, something that you and Lily did on the back, on the back end for all this. Yeah, so we would very recently send a list of um, the, open, the open space in the conservation parcels that have been acquired by Harvard. We're currently summarizing that, and I can, I can send that out. Okay. We would love it. Um, yeah. We'll that the, the, the original build up. Yeah. We're, we're kind of information junkies yeah. right here. We've been collecting it all and lots chewing on things. it, and we would love Jeff. that. So. Jeff wanted me to ask a question I couldn't answer. Well, <laughs> is Thank there you. more slides you want to take us through, or, or, or? Uh, just? Just one more. Sure, thank you. And so I just wanted to put in perspective, uh, 55,000 gallons per day doesn't mean anything unless you think of it in terms of what kind of development it represents. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about 200 residential units and 250,000 square feet of new commercial development, just as an order of magnitude mm -hmm. of how much development that represents that could stay near the target as in Houston City or potentially be reallocated to some of the other water that support growth in those areas. Well, and when you, this is a methodology question, it's my own ignorance. When you yeah. say 200 residential units, is that 200 one bedrooms? What's the assumption behind that? Like what does that Size. look like in terms of families and stuff? 2.5 people. Typically about 2.5 bedrooms. So it's yeah. in, um, by the census, it's in an average Got household. it, got it, got it. Thank you. Paul or somebody, how, how many, if we were going to actually meet the 10% affordable housing goal, do you know how many units we'd have to create? How does that relate to the 200? Not off the top of my head. I think it's higher than that. Oh, it's way higher than that. I think that. we need a lot it's more over, than that. I think it's like 565 more. I'd love to see a good chunk of the available. Yeah. So we're allowance to go in that direction. To meet the 10%. Yeah. Or at least get us up to 7%. Go ahead. And I guess the, the other, you know, in terms of allocating for future development, has anything, anybody looked at um, what areas of town have put potential for significant redevelopment? Mm -hmm. Dr. Turner, that comment on you. <laughs> but, I, but I almost see that kind of as an exercise of Absolutely. The LCP. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, outside of looking at just raw land. But yeah, then, yeah. You know, no, we take it seriously. Yeah. 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 And the number is very different yeah. with or without sewer. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, some, there's some areas in the, the Harwich Center area that uh, present some fairly significant redevelopment mm -hmm. once the sewer line comes here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> No. Yeah. But Dan, yeah, just a question bouncing off of, uh, of what Ed was alluding at. If we did identify an area of development, we still need to figure out how we're going to compensate that from a sewage flow perspective in the neighboring town for building our own plant. Is that right? Yeah, and if that flow is 
substantial above and beyond what would have been allowed, we, we may also have to go through that process with the Board of Selectmen to reallocate from watershed to watershed. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah, we have to take it away from one, right, and give it to another. Um, so it's not additional, it's just moving it. So I know nobody has a crystal ball, but since Chatham has a wastewater plant that we're borrowing some of their flow, and we had previous talks with Dennis, et cetera, et cetera, and we got crosswise, whatever, with them. Do you have a crystal ball as to when the other phases of town, when, when's it going to happen? I mean, we can talk till we're blue in the face about redevelopment in the next 10 years, and if we're talking about 50 years from now, before some of these areas may get redeveloped, I mean, that's that's a different local comprehensive plan. <laughs> are you talking about sewers, though? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah I mean. We're going to have thoughts, like, are we going to build our own, or are we going to go in with somebody? Right, I mean, are we getting close to yeah. negotiating, or? So, I have been in communication with um, staff over in the town of Dennis. Uh, my understanding is that they are going for some funding for this town meeting. Um, I also know that they are planning to build a treatment plan to treat about 50% of the townwide capacity in Dennis, which um, would mean essentially like Chatham, they would have a, a pretty sizable amount right. of free capacity in that plant to handle additional flows. Now, we still need to go through the process of establishing an intermunicipal agreement and, and everything that goes along with that, but it is my hope that we will um, be able to be successful with Dennis and, and partnering with them there. As far as um, you know, when this is all going to happen, I would say Dennis is just starting their design and construction. They're probably three to five years, I would say, from being ready to take flow from Harvard should that relationship you know, come together. In the meantime, I would say we have, you know, assuming votes go well, there's town support. We have our phase three project um, on town meeting this spring that's going to likely be a 24 or 36 month construction sequence so we're two to three years out there um, we also just recently received approval for our ARPA grant for the sewer collection system around Great Sand Lakes so in my I guess best case scenario I would see us completing phase three in the next two to three years in between the time when Dennis is available to accept flow from another part of town, we could then ideally address the Great Sand Lakes area in between. And then where we're also proposing to put a dry pipe in Route 28 in West Harwich, that would be my recommendation for the next logical place to go, which would probably be that five to seven year timeline. And, then uh, and hook it up with Dennis. Okay. Come out with draft regulations uh, to shorten our comprehensive wastewater management plan from 40 years to 20 years. They have been incredibly inundated with public comment uh, with respect to that and with the change in administration from Baker to Healy. I know they're still trying to get their feet. Um, I had a meeting with them two weeks ago and they had no proposed timeline for when they thought they might have regulations uh, coming back out to comment. So, um, it's still very much in the air whether it's going to be 20 or 40 years, but I think um, forward progress still needs to be, you know, made. I think uh, we're on the right path. So can I, so Dan, I just, fantastic job keeping us current because from what I understand, Harwich is way ahead of most towns on Cape Cod with respect to our wastewater management plan. And a lot of that has to do with you and your efforts, so great job there. That also keeps us very current with grants, right? So, because we're, we're perfectly positioned to be able to request money uh, for our town from state and federal. Is that correct? So I, I don't know how that would all play into our local comprehensive plan, if it does or it doesn't. I'm just kind of bringing it up so that we, we understand that having shovel-ready projects and being ahead of the game allows us better opportunity for grants. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. And, you know, we could be getting up to, to you know, 35% principal forgiveness on the phase three project due to the infrastructure bill, and, you know, things like that. So and that's um, that's real the money out there. Yeah, that's bottom line real money to the to the to the taxpayers. I think Barbara has a question, and then Jim, and we will try and get I'm you out of here. Sorry, one last thing, Anastasia. On your last slide, you had um, Witchmere Watershed. 
Then you had Route 28, Harwich Port, and you had the campground, all three of those. Can you explain to me, I didn't realize that Witchmere, the, the Witchmere watershed stops at a certain point, but I, on, I guess on the presentation when they, you gave it to count to selectmen, I don't remember the Harwich Port Route 28. I mean, where does that, how does that not intersect with Witchmere, I guess is what I'm asking. And then the campground is just below that. Do you have a map that you can send us on that? I, yes, so I have. Um, I don't have it available right now. No, no, no. I don't need it. I just, I just want to. Some of them are obvious. That that one, since they're so close together and so old and everything, is more challenging as far as some of the flows and stuff on the dates on that. Of course, and um, so the campground area has very small lots that it's hard to site septic systems on, which is why this is included in the centralized wastewater management plan. Um, Great Sand Lakes is to address the, the freshwater body. Um, and then Route 20 is a portion to the west that's outside of the um, and it's been impacted the watershed. But I can, I can send that map around. All right. That. Great. Thank you. And just, just to build on that, too, while you're seeing, you know, while you're saying, well, that's right in that section of 28, why is it segregated out? Right. Um, the areas like Route 28 and Harwich Port and the campground area actually don't impair a harbor and embayment with nitrogen. Right. They, right. they drain directly to Nantucket Sound. So that's why Witchmere is isolated and broken out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, I figured that, but at, when I was reading okay. when I was reading the, the plan and looking at your presentation, it wasn't clear as far as the areas when you were talking about the different different phases for the sewering and everything as far as those were kind of, since they don't go into an impaired watershed, they were kind of put to the side. I was just trying to get a handle on the whole thing in that area. Thank you. I think Jim had a question. Yeah, or just, <clears throat> I just want to say something in addition to Jeff about money. <laughs> but, um, and, um, because I do think money's emerging and we are in a good spot. There's also money that is really being talked a lot about both on the federal level and in philanthropy level of, of supporting assisted uh, of, of affordable housing and worrying about uh, where all these 85 year olds are going to be taken care of um, mm -hmm. that are you know increasing every year so there are lots of opportunities I think of being ahead of the curve to mm -hmm. uh, raise money for these things with that thank you so much Dan and Anastasia we're so grateful appreciate for, it yeah you're, thank thank you. you're spectacular and you have huge uh, allies in us, so thank you for being here. And thank you for sharing your expertise with us. We're very grateful. Appreciate yeah, your time. Right. Well, you're not, you, haven't seen the, you haven't seen the last of us, because like I said, we're, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, we're really committed to this whole process and really bring a really diverse and really uh, energetic perspective to it, and your work is so key, so thank you. We're grateful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Escape while you can. That's good. I get it, man. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. That's the worst. For the kids. I, I found what I read today, which I'll send to you, but the Axios that I subscribe to, and it shows the Cape growing oh, yeah. by 5% yeah, over the yeah. last this is, uh, two this, years. Yeah. This data stuff. All right, so I think we, we dug into some really strong data there. Um, we'll put, I'll get all the files, because I think we all process information a little bit differently, so we'll put it all in the Google Drive so we can come back to it. Uh, Paul, thank you for being patient with us. Really Thank you. Yes, let me share it. You're, you're, I'll turn, you, turn it over to you. Um, I we think that the, the, the last subject matter is going to be um, one of the focal points of the update of the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. um, the comprehensive plan is supposed to be a roadmap for our future, and it's to, to carefully manage growth and development in the future. And um, that interrelationship between um, the five watersheds and the amount of flow that was projected and the 2016 build out um, and how all that's going to shake out in connection with future growth and development and redevelopment um, is really going to be a lot of what we're going to be talking about. So it seems like we have a, a strong team um, with Dan and GHD, Anastasia's company, 
Um, they're in the, in, the, in the throes of updating that uh, comprehensive wastewater management plan. And so um, I think they, their work, the updated of that plan will be ahead of this one, but um, I think that's going to open up a lot of conversations about what we want to see in the future. The, the comment about redevelopment, redevelopment, we should think about that as predominantly um, um, a commercial thing. Uh, commercial properties uh, have a lot of traffic and, and uh, companies like Dunkin Donuts will go in and every t 10 years, you know, gut and remodel a store. Just based on the amount of traffic that's going in and out, wearing things out in them wanting to keep, uh, you know, a look that brings in the customers. So um, redevelopment, if we think of like a single family subdivision, there's not going to be any redevelopment. You know, people will tear down a house. They'll re rebuild it, but the amount of flow from that isn't really going to change that much. Um, so what you're saying, just for me to clarify, is when you're thinking of, when you're modeling in our mind for anticipation of redevelopment, you, we should be thinking commercial, like big commercial changes. Yes. I, I, and I don't know, just to clarify, was that what you were asking, Ed? Or you were well, thinking I, I, more of opportunities to meet, like, housing goals and stuff yeah, via that, redevelopment, right? There are, you know, there um, believe it or not, through the, the center part of town, there are uh, plots of land that are basically either underused or, or unused that uh, um, provided for uh, a way to deal economically with wastewater, uh, short of putting in you know, some sort of package plant um, uh, could sustain a, a, a much larger level of density than it's currently zoned for. Kind of two separate yeah. issues, but yeah. I, I got you, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, and most commercial properties are not built up even close to the maximum yeah. extent. We have mostly single story <coughs> buildings and two stories allowed, yeah. not a double if, if those were torn down and, and rebuilt. So. Yeah. But for example, if, if we did focus more on redevelopment of areas such as Harwood Center or Harwich Port or whatever, combination of sewer and 40B densities could add up to a significant amount of redevelopment. So I think that would become a noticeable number if the thinking went in that direction. Yeah, the 40Bs, are, are, they're a wild card. It, it's hard to predict, you know, where. They are a wild card, but it's still the sort of tool yeah. that this group could suggest as part of the town's vision. And, and, you know, although most people, you know, wouldn't want to hear this, that is compact development. When, when you build a, a residential building three stories high, it doesn't have to spread out over acres and acres as one or two story buildings, but it, 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 it condenses that development to create a smaller development footprint. Yeah. It's out of scale, and much one of the reasons why most people don't like to see two or three, uh, three story buildings, but that's the, the other yeah, the side of it is, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It, it goes back to, you know, do we want to lose our identity as to who we are, as to all of a sudden have, you know, a four-story yeah. well, compromise? There's, yeah. so. there's that, but, you know, there, 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 were, there are, you know, a, a handful of projects around that potentially are like the, uh, the Royal. I mean, you know, it was a, sort mm -hmm. of a failing nursing care facility and was there was a proposal some of those. Right, which doesn't oh. change the character yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. not change the character but increase substantially a number of uh, housing units right. in the center of town which has an impact on the few the handful of businesses in the mm -hmm. center of town you know? uh, and there may, there may be some under underutilized um, commercial properties too that you know you could do housing over or even housing under you know, I mean, it's there. There are well, possibilities like that. Do you want to tell us about our potential consultant and all? Because I know everyone's going to be. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, tell I, us all the news or lack thereof. I'm afraid I missed that. But I don't. No, have a lot you have to not report. missed it. Um, I don't have a lot to report, um, but I, I handed out a list of uh, individuals that signed out the request for a proposal. Um, I hope, hope this doesn't it. indicate that I'm an interesting. Yeah, you're, 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 <laughs> you're, you're the front runner. You're the front runner. I tell you, that, I, I, I don't don't understand that. <laughs> we're here to make a deal. That's Dave. about the last thing I'm interested in. I'll make a motion <laughs> that Dave. 
<laughs> Sign him up. <laughs> um, so a couple weeks ago, there was a, an opportunity for anyone who has um, uh, downloaded the RFP to uh, to come to town hall for an optional um, question and answer session. That uh, question and answer session came and went with no one coming. Um, I also have not received really any calls, emails, or queries about the RFP. Um, these are great signs um, about what the outcome's going to be, and I am um, somewhat apprehensive about w what's going to happen. Uh, Thursday, the 13th, at 3 o'clock is the deadline for firms to submit proposals. I'll, uh, I'll uh, send out an email on Friday morning um, to let you know what happened. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, given the circumstances of having multiple expired plans, the housing production plan, the open space and recreation plan, um, we put together an RFP that said, you know, in addition to just doing a chapter on open space and recreation, you will do a chapter on open space and recreation that will check off all the boxes for the state to certify the town's plan. And we did the same with housing. Um, it could be that that was uh, hoping or asking for too much with uh, a budget of $200,000 to update the plan. So uh, we will find out Thursday if that's the case. Um, there are other factors that we may not even be aware of, of how many other towns are out there doing, updating their, uh, their uh, master plans across the state um, and, and you know, how many consulting firms there are out there that do this kind of work. It's, I've always understood that this, and I think I mentioned this when we talked before, that this is not the kind of contract that these companies make a lot of money off right. of. Um, usually uh, communities end up kind of squeezing more work and time out of consultants than was originally planned in their budget. Um, and so these consultants have to be careful with their time not to overextend themselves. So they're, they're um, you know, there's a, like a half a dozen companies in the state that do this kind of work. There's two or three that do um, the majority of it. Um, some of those firms, the ones that I highlighted on my sheet, um, I knew the company or I knew some of the people involved, um, principals in those companies, they were familiar to me. Um, but it, at this point, it's hard to say are, what's going to happen. Are most of these off Cape? Because um, yeah, is, is the bridge construction? The, the, I mean, uh, is that something that's a deterrent? People not want to deal with that? Well, theoretically, that's supposed to quit for the summer by Memorial Day. It's brutal. I know. I know. But I know the man's living it. What? So what are Virginia? I mean, we're we're not going to count our, kids, plan our chickens B. before our you know they're hatched. Mm -hmm. What what are just what's you thinking as some of our options? So um, so we don't despair. <laughs> it, it, we, we might end up only getting you know one proposal or two sure. proposals, sure. and and at this point maybe that would be good. Yeah. Um, if we get no we get proposals, some. then we're going to have to step back and regroup. Mm -hmm. We will likely need to, to we will either uh, maybe change that thing to, to the, the RFP to, to not require that they produce certified plans, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and or we could seek additional funds. Right. It's my understanding that we, we could probably tap into the um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund mm -hmm. to pay for um, uh, that element or, or to subsidize mm -hmm. getting a, a housing production plan that could be certified by the state. Um, we, maybe we could do something similar with um, the Community Preservation Fund for updating the open space and recreation okay. plan. Mm -hmm. So we have options. Um, or, you know, nobody wants to go back to town meeting and ask for money again, but if we tell folks that we tried and this was the outcome and that the economy's changed and the cost of everything has gone up, this included, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, this could be a setback of time where we have to figure out where um, we can um, round up some additional money to get the job done. 
Um, there, there are a couple people here that I know that if we don't get a proposal, or if we don't get any proposals, I can call them and get some that's insights what, from what them about do. what okay. we did wrong yeah. um, or, or what okay. the circumstances are that, that caused no, yeah. no proposals. Made us less attractive. Mm -hmm. I can quite understand. Where, where did these names come from? Are these names you so, came um, up with? Or? In order to get, when we, uh, when we advertised the request for proposals, we um, had a website that, that these companies had to go to, and before they could download the request for proposals, they had to give us their contact information. That's why Sticky. And there's a couple of different Let's reasons why we do say. that, but, but yeah. one of them was so that we, we know who's taking it up <laughs> in case we have to, in case there was an error or a clarification or a mm -hmm. question that one firm asked. We need to be mm -hmm. able to respond to all the firms with the answer to that question. So that's why. Um, this, this approach has been kind of modernized over the last 10 or 15 years, and it, and it works pretty well. I have a question. So what's your gut feeling? I'm hoping that we get one. Sure. Uh, I, I, but I'm, I'm kind of apprehensive. Long. Absolutely no calls or emails to me. Nothing. It's yeah, a yellow flag waving. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So, yes. so the problem, if we don't get any, and, and we're trying to look for funds, the trust can move quickly. Um, the CPC, you, I mean, the way they run it here, mm -hmm. you're out of luck until a year from now. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, there is, you know, I've always <laughs> been one to look at some of the out of the box ways uh, you could move to amend the town budget, specifically the planning budget, increase your line item on consultants, and as a funding source, take it out of the. Uh, um, uh, what they call it, uh, the, uh, the fund, you know, that you put money in. Rainy, Rainy day, day fund. fund. What, what's it? <laughs> free cash. No, not free cash. Uh, the uh, stabilization fund. Oh. Yeah. So that's all I have on that subject matter, and um, yeah. I will circle back by the end of the week and let okay. you know what happens. No, and we'll, you know, get in touch, and I will distribute, mm -hmm. yeah, or communicate with the committee as a well. whole. Yeah. Keep your fingers crossed. Yeah, okay, and then um, I think, you know, we've been, is there anything else? I think we digested a lot. You highlighted to us how important water is. Is there anything from your planner perspective that we should digest or you want to draw attention to to what we heard tonight? No, uh, other than you know what I said, where yeah. I really think the, the yeah, wastewater and water is going to be the foundation yeah. uh, yep. of a lot of decision making and and being conservative about how that's handled. Yeah, um, it, it's going to be important. Um, I.e., you know, not overextend ourselves with our gallons. Is what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, every town has to grow, and, and and the economy can't remain stagnant. And so these are some of the tug of war issues that we're going to have to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because all these things would, would lead to tax increases and stuff like that. Is that your concern? The, so, the opposite. So, uh, growth and development in increases the amount of, of taxes that, that okay. come in. Commercial development helps to take some of the burden off of the mm -hmm. residential taxpayer. And that's why some communities Chase um, commercial really, development. really focus on economic development because that, that lessens the burden on the taxpayers. We're limited. What, I mean, we're not going to chase Target in Harwich, right? Mm -hmm. So this is like, you know, right? We're, and, yeah. you know, we're somewhat limited in what our commercial options are. It seems so, there's a different tax dynamic on the Cape. I would almost argue that we need almost no commercial development because of what the second home market does. Now, whether that's a good goal to follow yeah. is another question. The more people there are, the more demand there are yeah, for goods but, and services. But, but you, need certain, you need different kinds of services. Yeah, UPS and FedEx. But if you look at the amount of services needed to serve the population that doesn't have any schools, I bet you'd find that the second home market probably helps the town. Is it an interesting much. game? Of course, sure. it's yeah. sure. that's, that's the millionaires. No, I, uh, that's the biggest tax. I right? come from California, and I, I don't understand why a town would would uh, go after commercial property because, as far as I can see, there's no revenue for them ex except for property taxes. In California, um, if you have a a uh, car dealership, you get uh, one percent of all sales, and that's sales of parts and new cars and used cars, um, and all those things. And you get uh, um, uh, business license fees. The state of California, Sears, 
repairs because they operate in every town in the mm -hmm. state. Every year they sign a check for $150 for a business license in all 100, 600 towns <laughs> in the state, you know. But there's, there's no similar fees here that uh, commercial development pay. So, some areas outside of Boston have a two-tiered tax rate. The last community I worked in, um, the, the commercial taxpayers pay double the re what the residential yeah, taxpayers yeah. And that's, there's a lot of mm -hmm. communities outside yeah. the periphery of Split uh, rate, uh, yeah. Metro Boston that, that have a two-tiered tax system. Yeah. Like that. But it's also legal here to have uh, investors, I think, right, that to, would be to tax seasonal people uh, higher than oh, tax. Which has tax. never gone there. That'll never, yes. yeah. Been right. some talk aren't the, aren't the Cape but tax rates quite a bit lower than the average? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And we don't have much commercial that's causing that. It's a joke. How much how low our tax all right, with that, before we all turn into pumpkins, but yes, not to cut anyone off, but um, just our, our last bit of business, Paul. Um, <laughs> sorry, I know you want to run away. I understand. The, um, should I approach, uh, or did you want on our behalf to have a little pitch at a uh, town meeting, or should we wait and see what happens, actually, probably, if we get some proposals, huh? Um, How much do we want to say that we're here? Two yeah. suggestions. Um, yes. Usually, uh, as as voters walk into town meeting, there's a table with yeah. handouts. Yes. And I would suggest a, a, a colored piece of paper update summary of what's been done so far. Yeah. Okay. And, and okay. you know, a, asking people to stay tuned because there was going to be a series sure. of topical. Yeah. That's good. Uh, okay. Just the workshops. Okay. Um, and um, if if. The committee wants to get up and do a brief um, update for town meeting and let, you, let you, everybody know what's going on. You can do that as well. Okay. Um, there are um, a lot of articles, and it's predicted to take a few nights. So yeah. um, if there is going to be a presentation, it should just be like a one or two minutes, just a quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be respectful of your time, so you could... And, Can and, we let him go? Yeah, let yeah, Paul well, go? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> He's got to get over the bridge and yeah. come back. Poor guy. Thank you, Paul, oh, very much. Thanks, Thank Paul. You. Thanks, Paul. I guess, the, you know, the other issue is if, if we don't get any and we need to look for yeah, the, I, additional I would, funds. In terms of our discussion, why don't we, or, well, we can open it for discussion. My initial thought would be, like, we can definitely put together a little flyer that we this is what we've done, but maybe we want to... Uh, wait on thinking how much we want to pitch ourselves. We're yeah, back. till after, thir <laughs> after Thursday. Or not. Yeah. Wait, mm -hmm. Is there some discussion about that? No, I, I, th I think we should wait and see on that. But yes. we, what, ab what about um, our meeting in May? Yes. Right. So, perfect. Um, so, moving through that. So, we were scheduled for the second, which obviously we can't do. That's town meeting. Um, a one, two, four weeks from today would be Monday the 8th. That would be Presuming great. we can find a room, is that acceptable to do? Monday the 8th of May. May. Right. I can't be here. Tuesday the 9th? I, I can't Tuesday be here. Tuesday the 9th would be better for me, but I can make the 8th. What? Tuesday the 9th would be good for me. Tuesday the 9th. I would have to do it remotely, Are you but I could chair the meeting remotely. Are you out of town? Yeah. Yeah. That Are week? you both of them? Uh, I'm flying home on the 9th. So both would be tricky. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, on Monday the eighth, would you be able to attend remotely? No. You don't. No. 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 I'm going to be in New Orleans. Okay. It's, no, you're going to be having fun. Yeah. I heard um, yeah. Would Would yeah. the fifteenth suit or, everyone better? Or, or even the tenth or eleventh? Jazz that festival. Fifteenth. Yeah. The fifteenth. Oh. The, the middle yeah. of the week, I would never be here in person. Okay. And as your chair, I do feel 15th, somewhat responsible. Fifteenth works for me. <laughs> What? The fifteenth. Okay. May fifteenth could work for me. Fifteenth works Garrett, for me Garrett, I too. know you're always traveling on Monday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we appreciate your remote participation. <laughs> Wherever you are. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's what I do. Yeah. Here. Okay. I think the spot. Uh, All right. Is so, that okay so, so what? Monday the any of any of it? Um, I believe. Oh, okay. Let me just so double check so one more time. Like I'll, I'll never be here in person because I'm always in Wisconsin. Yes, they, and Tuesdays, <laughs> so the 15th, so that's, le that's, select, that's, that's select board, right? Yes. Monday. So, why don't, let me, so let me tentative, let's tentatively put into the minutes that so we have a tentative next meeting date of Monday the 15th. Okay. Um, but I, let me confirm, let me confirm the room. 
Right. Let me confirm the room availability. Yeah, and I, will, I will circle back with you on May 15th. For, you know, in the next few days that Monday, May 15th is the day. Because we, what, I mean, what we had intended for that meeting was for it to be an opportunity to interview. Right. That's right. Oh, right. That's right. right. Yeah. So, that would so be we have to be a little. We have to be a little bit flexible. Right. That's right. This stuff. Yeah. So don't don't not that, go right. to something super important. And I will as soon as I know anything, that, right. that I will, place I'm, yeah. will communicate with yeah. you because I, I really respect. I get the schedule stuff. So the schedule is fifteenth. Let's just pencil. Let's pencil it. Pencil. In. But don't, yes. May fifteenth. Right. Ten no, it, it may be it may be the interview in place of a meeting. Right. If we have an applicant. Yeah. And then still on the calendar, which I think we should leave on the calendar because that's our recurring day and we may need to meet fairly closely depending on what's going on, is Tuesday, June 6th. Okay. June 6th. I'm so back is, on the regular. Yes. So to speak. If, if we're not foiled yep. by something, some in a, an anticipated right. obstacle and I'm just, <laughs> like we were last week. Uh, and I'm just coming in from Switzerland, so okay. I'll miss that. Okay. Right. It's hard, man. It's well, hard. But we just bring us chocolates and you're okay. As early as we I can, we'll try, to, we'll try to schedule. I, and I really appreciate we. This was a much better attendance than I expected. I was worried it might just be me here, but thank you for that. <laughs> okay, well, we're in our open discussion. So yes. I don't know if anybody saw on the CapeCod.com website, but um, the Barnstable Local uh, Comprehensive yes. Plan is out there for comment and for yes. reading. Oh, yes. And stuff. So, um, CapeCod.com. Well, you have to go to the Barnstable. I mean, Barnstable. Oh, Barnstable. Oh, okay. I'll have to look for it then. Okay. Just and FYI on that. You know, the other issue is, you know, if if we don't get anybody, and the the cause seems to be that we basically don't have enough money. Um, we will revisit. We'll we have will, to revisit well, the whole approach. See if we can, if there is an avenue to. Get additional funds out of this current. Yeah, yeah that's why I was asking yeah. Paul to yeah. kind of share some of his thinking. I have yeah. other thoughts, but we'll yeah, as well. In addition. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. With that, we have a tentative next meeting date. I will keep you posted when we hear Friday whether we've got any proposals. Thank you, everyone, for right. your really thoughtful questions. We respect that. Yeah, we need to push the button. Yes. Uh, no, I need a oh. motion to yes. make a motion <laughs> to adjourn. Close Anyone adjourn. a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, and uh, Peter, are you still there? Aye. 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 Thank you. Oh, right. We have to do a vote. Right? We have to do it by just technically. Ed, you are yeah, we got to yeah. Could you say your name and that we're Ed. Aye. Barbara, aye. Jeff, aye. David, aye. Joyce, aye. Brian, aye. Margo, aye. Jim, aye. Thank you, everyone.